Jim's a very accomplished, I think one of the most accomplished uh, researchers in the entire field of remote sensing, satellite remote sensing especially. Uh, widely recognized, and I think appreciate for his work on uh, some of the things he's going to tell us about today, share with us. Um, I first uh, got to know Jim back almost 40 years ago. <coughs> he's a graduate student at Colorado State University making uh, field level plot measurements of the relationship between biomass and spectral reflectance and working with NDVI. Uh, invited him to give a seminar at Purdue University where I was. Uh, very good seminar. I think this will be the second, but even better uh, because it's up to global extent. A few years later, uh, he was at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center where he's now senior scientist. Um, was there, visited him. He's very excited about showing me what he's currently working on. Went out in the hallway, showed me these color printouts of NDVI from AVHR data. I had not been following AVHR too much. I was working with Landsat. Landsat four spectral bands at that time, 80 meters spatial resolution compared to AVHR. Only two bands that we really might be interested in, probably, mostly. And a thousand meters. What could you do with that? Well, in a few minutes, I was convinced you could do a great deal with that. Jim had these printouts of uh, across the African continent, particularly emphasizing the Sahel region, desertification at that time, and following the changes. Turns out, AVHR had two really, really important characteristics compared to Landsat um, that were very helpful for that. One, two, those. Those were important bands for spectral, looking spectrally in vegetation, but even more. Temporal resolution, daily coverage, daily coverage, and large area coverage. Um, so really good. That's what Jim's going to be talking about today, how he's extended that kind of data to uh, regional, to continental, to global scales, looking at trends, changes in NDVI over time, some, what, 31 years? Um, really powerful approach, I think. And so I'm very pleased Jim is here with us. Well, thanks, Mark. To share these results. So thank you for a second very kind introduction. Um, I'll be talking about some work, and of course, in any sort of scientific work now, unless you work on theory, you work in groups. And so what I'm talking about is, is a first person plural, and Jorge Penzon is the applied mathematician in my group who has put our non-stationary data set together. And so I'll be discussing a non-stationary eight kilometer data set globally. Uh, it's bi-monthly. Uh, so we have two compositing periods, first part of the month, second part of the month, uh, which, is, which now we're in our 33rd year of it. So one of the things about academics, and I teach at the University of Maryland where I'm an adjunct professor, uh, we're all interested in uh, um, in several things. One is publications, the second is frequent flyer miles, the third is grants, and the, one of the beauties of a long time series is you always need more data, and this translates into two things, job security and travel possibilities because you need to go places and see what's going on. Anyway, so I, I'm, I'm a big enthusiast of, uh, of time series, and I'll show some new results, and, and new results means within the past uh, several months, from this um, um, a data set which runs from July of 1981 through December of 2012 now. Uh, okay, so one, um, I actually did all my graduate studies for my, for my master's and PhD at Colorado State University in the grassland biome, studying grass vegetation, how, how, how to measure uh, total dry matter accumulation or the process of photosynthesis. Uh, and uh, uh, in the course of that, uh, I published several papers on band selection. Then I went to the Goddard Space Flight Center as a postdoctoral fellow, and one of the first things I did was I gave a seminar on band selection, and my branch head, Charlie Snessler at the time, said, well, what do you think about these bands on this NOAA satellite, which, which was the so-called advanced very high resolution radiometer? It's not advanced, and it's not very high resolution. It was designed probably maybe 1970 or something like this. So way before several of you here were even born. But anyway, one of the weird things about this instrument, um, 
was they had two bands which overlapped. So here's the first channel, which is the upper half of the visible. But then it extended into the infrared, and then there was this infrared band right here. And they overlap, and so therefore, um, I mean, any consideration of information theory, you need to confine spectral bands to where you have unique information. And there's no value to making them really broad because you average out a lot inf so it's, uh, of information. So especially for vegetation and for many other things, where you have very strong reflectance here, you have strong absorption here, you combine them and it's a complete wash. So he said, go over and talk to the people at NOAA and see if you can't convince them based upon uh, your work on band selection to change this. So I went over and talked to a guy named Stan Schneider and another guy named Dave McGinnis and explained why these bands should be discrete. And they said, well, they would see what could be done. So they called me back and said, well, we've been partially successful. The bands are discrete, but I had advocated them being much, much narrower, uh, especially on, on, on the infrared band to avoid a water vapor feature. And they said, well, look, the bands are broad, uh, but uh, we have some luck in, uh, and so then they were moved to still very wide or broad bands like you see here, but at least they were discrete. So um, then the next satellite in the NOAA series, which was launched, had this configuration for channel one and channel two. There were three emissive channels uh, as well, or three thermal channels. Um, and then uh, at the same time, uh, even though these bands are better, uh, they're not, uh, they're, they're far from ideal, but they still work. So this is just a comparison. Here we have these very broad bands on the AVHRR, and so they win the contest for being uh, of the wide bodies uh, as compared to something like Miser, Modus, Sea uh, or even Vegetation. But anyway, so uh, then I went to the Goddard Space Flight Center and uh, uh, started making handheld uh, measurements and all go back to that. So I'm going to jump forward and then come back. So in the data set which we have, which, which now we're using from July of 1981 through December of 2012 as sort of a beta testing way, it involves data from, the, from instruments on NOAA 7, NOAA 9, NOAA 11, and then we had to jump back to NOAA 9, which had rocked around the clock because one of the features of the early of the NOAA 7, NOAA 9, NOAA 11 um, satellites was that they were not in a fixed equatorial crossing time. The orbit persisted one or two minutes per month to a later and later time. There was no station keeping. And uh, this is another thing which was weird about the NOAA system, but it worked out well because what was formerly an overpass time at 2.30 in the morning, by the time that NOAA 11 was up, and maybe six years or maybe 10 years after the launch of NOAA 9, NOAA 9 had rocked around the clock. So now there was a 9.30 in the morning overpass time. It was the opposite node. It was an ascending node instead of a descending node. But therefore, we could use those data rather than use data from, uh, from, from 5 o'clock in the afternoon from NOAA 11. So then we switched back to NOAA 9. Then we picked up uh, with NOAA 14, and the NOAA 16 and NOAA 18, and now we have, we have the possibility of continuing the data after NOAA 18 with data from MEDOPS 1, MEDOPS 2, and MEDOPS 3 because these instruments, the advanced very high resolution radiometers, were manufactured in batches. So they got the cost down to 50 or 60 million at the end of the run, and then NOAA gave three of them to the Europeans for their polar orbiting meteorological satellites which are called the MEDOPS satellites, and so they are now flying. Their imager is an AVHRR instrument. So we have the ability to extend this data set, hopefully for four or five or six more years. Okay, so as a graduate student, the guy I worked for, Lee Meller, who I believe Marv knew, um, was really interested in trying to find out about um, photosynthesis and primary production to get it at, at, at the biological mass produced as a consequence of photosynthesis. This is just the action spectrum of photosynthesis. Um, and uh, the reason that a normalized difference vegetation index works is because you're able to get an, an independent measurement of the energy that's absorbed in the visible spectrum, which drives photosynthesis. And you simply normalize that by a band outside, but very 
close to this band in the red region of the spectrum. Okay, so um, when I went to the Goddard Space Flight Center, I quickly realized the travel possibilities of a handheld radiometer. And so the first summer I was there, I, I, I went on a tour at my own expense as a postdoc to Iceland, England, the south of France, and also the northern part of Sweden. Uh, having published a paper, uh, the people I worked with didn't write up or publish the work which they did on, on, on their handheld instrument or on the spectrometer which we used. So I said, look, I'll be happy to write this up for you. Uh, I'll handle all the reviews and things like this, and, and I'll make myself the most junior author just to get the work out, and I'll put in a few examples of data which I'll collect with the instrument. So this is a follow-on instrument, but because of that, people wrote to me and said, why don't you bring your non-destructive biomass meter and come to our research site this summer? So I thought, wow, okay, well, this sounds like fun. So I did, and in Iceland, and working with people there, conditions changed all the time, but the normalized difference vegetation index was very stable under direct light, indirect light, a mixture of the two. And so I thought, wow, maybe there's something here which I could exploit in other ways. So then we started making some measurements of winter wheat um, to look at total dry matter accumulation in Beltsville, Maryland. And this is from a handheld um, experiment where uh, th these are three of 20 plots. And, these, and this is just the time profile. So we would look out of, out of our window if we saw a day like today at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Brent Holbin and I would go out in the field, would drive out and make these measurements and come back, process the data immediately. And over the course of the growing season starting in March, so this is um, um, in mid-March starting here, um, and, and this was the behavior, things came up. There was a rain event here which accelerated the growth. Then it dried out, then it rained again, and so on and so forth. But we found if you simply computed the area beneath these curves, um, it was highly related to the biomass. And this was the harvest of biomass. So we actually had a party doing this. We came in, we cut down all the vegetation, which is in the background, and then we weighed it. And when we formed this simple XY plot of our summed or integrated NDVI data versus the, 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 the destructively sampled above ground dry biomass of winter wheat, we were able to explain 80% of the biomass accumulation. This is a very narrow range experiment, so we were really encouraged. But being NASA, my branch head, Charlie Snessler again, said, well, why don't you, how would you apply this from space? Because after all, you're a postdoc at NASA and we're supposed to be doing things in space. So when, when Brent Holbin and I wrote this paper, we mentioned the only satellite to apply this technique from was a time series instrument like the advanced very high resolution radiometer carrying instrument or uh, uh, satellites. So then some friends in northern Senegal called me and said, hey, would you come over to Senegal and bring some of your handheld instruments and let's see how they work. This was in, in the summer of 1981. NOAA 7 had just been launched, so I put in a request to get weekly satellite coverage of a one kilometer spatial resolution over all of northern Senegal. And so then we continued this in 81, 82, 83, and 84, because there we had the ability with this group to go out and try and sample areas on the ground that were one kilometer by one kilometer. Now clipping, it's really a pain in the neck or worse. It's a lot of hard work, and it, you usually have to do it at the end of the growing season, which in Africa is pretty hot um, when things dry out. But, we were, but the people there were able to do this. I helped in two of the years. And this is a plot of all of the data we collected in northern Senegal. So now each of these points represents an area about one kilometer by one kilometer. And of course, you can't sample all the vegetation, so you have to only maybe have 20 or 25 one meter of plots within each of these kilometers, but, but try and pick, hom pick homogeneous areas. And this is how the data look. All the data are included, and so we were still able to explain about 70% of the variation. So this was a major success. Now, one of the reasons for this is that um, uh, just by coincidence, working on the south side of the Sahara, you have a monsoonal rainy season, which means the rains propagate up, and it's, 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 it's very constrained in time. It's maybe two or three months long. And even though you may only have 300 millimeters of precipitation on average, uh, it's concentrated in a two-month period. Um, 
as opposed to, say, the American Southwest. I'm from New Mexico where it can rain or snow throughout the year and you don't have this sort of green flush followed by a dry season. And so this is just an association between average NDVI from about uh, 63 observing stations in the Sahelian and Sudanian zone of Africa south of the equator uh, versus the average precipitation from those stations, and it's very good. Now, precipitation in, this, in these areas, in most semi-arid areas, is the principal determinant of primary production. So this is not surprising. Okay, so we had this experiment, um, which we were just lucky as hell. There's no other explanation for it. In the northern part of Senegal, right here, there's a precipitation gradient in Africa, which runs from the Sahara as you go south of about one millimeter of precipitation per year per kilometer in the north-south direction. So you sort of go from being hyper dry and then it gradually gets wetter and wetter and then you get into a tree savanna and then pretty soon you're into a tropical forest. And if you travel north to south or, or south to north, it's like passing from night into day and you don't know when the sun rose or when the sun set because the changes are so subtle. And it's all due because of this precipitation gradient. So uh, this then got us going. Things worked with the AVHR data, as you saw in that previous plot. Uh, and uh, then it was sort of, well, why not process all the data for Africa? This is just a figure showing the marked difference between the rainy season and the dry season. Uh, this is the same termite mound for reference here and here. They're just like different areas. So you pass through here in the dry season, you think, wow, this is really dry. And then you pass through in the rainy season, and you say, God, this is really, really green. And, and uh, um, it, uh, as you see on the right. And now when you work in, in unusual places, things happen. Here we have broken down much of the amusement of all the villagers who came out and sort of think, well, these Europeans, uh, 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 they were trying to do too much. And you end up being stuck places for a few days, but it always makes for some good stories afterwards. Okay, so we demonstrated you could use AVHR data to, to um, and, and sum them over time to form a non-destructive from satellites estimate of total dry matter production. Now you can't really test that places except on herbaceous vegetation. Because woody vegetation, you have no idea when the carbon or the biomass in the wood was deposited because they persist over several years. So now this is another figure. This is from, Rang from Ranga Mainini, uh, one of, uh, of my coworkers and, and good friends, where, hmm, well, something has gotten completely screwed up here. Anyway, these are data from Flux Towers, and this is Net Ecosystem Exchange, and this is plotted against the inner goal. I have no idea what happened to this. Um, of, uh, of the summed NDVI, um, but it shouldn't have been linked. Oh, gosh. And then this has come from somewhere else. Anyway, but so what we're talking about is coming along for areas and then simply summing them during the growing season. I wonder if... Okay, so this is a figure which came after we started our work from someone else. They simply measured the intercepted photosynthetically active radiation uh, at the bottom of a plant canopy by having an instrument at the bottom of it. This is for wheat. This is from Arizona. It's from uh, uh, more than 40 or uh, it's from almost 35 years ago. Uh, and then this is the normalized difference vegetation index, which was, which was measured coincidentally at the top of the canopy at the same time. And so what you see is that this index is directly related to the absorbed uh, photosynthetically active radiation that drives photosynthesis. So when there's no more radiation to be absorbed, then the NDVI doesn't increase. It doesn't saturate, but there's just no more energy because all the energy has been absorbed. So here's just an image of Africa. So once you could do this, then you said, well, let's process global data. Let's get the data every day. Let's do this in real time. And then all kinds of possibilities will, um, popped up. You publish papers on it. People write you and say, why don't you do this? We'll be happy to work with you. Why don't you do that? Etc. So now I'm going to talk about, uh, now we've extended this data set. Uh, uh, it's now in its uh, 33rd year, but I'll be talking about results from the data set from 1981 or 1982 through 2011 and 2012, papers that have been published within the past year. 
So Rasmus Finholt, who's at the University of Copenhagen, uh, I was on his PhD committee, uh, and, and he's published a paper in Marv's journal recently comparing different data sets, and especially comparing our data set uh, to data from the MODIS instruments. Now, in my opinion, MODIS is the gold standard. Anything I do, I compare it to MODIS data with, with our data set. Uh, and of course, uh, the, MODIS data, the MODIS data from Terra start at the start of 2000 and run through the present. And from Aqua, they start uh, in 2002 uh, and run through the present. Um, so anything I do, I always compare them to MODIS. I view MODIS as being the gold standard. So this is their paper. And when they compared MODIS in DVI data to our GEMS 3G in DVI data, and the blue areas are where you have an extremely high correlation between them. And in these areas, you have a very low correlation. Uh, so I looked at this and thought, wow, well, this is interesting. So I said, Rasmus, uh, why don't you compare modus aqua to modus terra and see how that looks? And so he did. And lo and behold, you have the same problem because of clouds and aerosols. So therefore, there are several points to draw from this. One is you need to be really, really careful when you're working in the humid tropics because of clouds and aerosols. And there's a lot of contention about two or three papers in the scientific literature right now. Did the Amazon basin green up during a drought or not? And this is a terrible place to try and use satellite data unless you're really, really careful. And I think that the results in several of these contentious papers are artifacts. And they're artifacts of clouds and aerosols. Where do aerosols come from? From biomass burning. Because when it's dry in the dry season, it's when you burn. And if it's a drought year, then people really burn. Right agriculture? Yes. That it, um, when you clear tropical forest uh, for agricultural purposes, you clear it during the dry season, you let it dry, and then you burn it. Frequently, they don't even extract the trees, which are valuable for lumber because it would cost too much to get them out in many places. Sometimes they will selectively log and take a few tree species out. But um, uh, usually in any hectare, there's only one or two species of any particular tree. Uh, Okay, so that was something which Rasmus did. Then uh, I've been comparing some of our data to fluorescence data from, uh, from the GOM-2 satellite. Uh, and so I decided for the Russian drought to make some comparisons between these three larger areas and do this between AVHRR and MODIS to see how things would compare there. So uh, in 2010, there was uh, a very major drought in Russia in exactly those areas that I showed. Um, and so here is a comparison between data for, for area three. Uh, so just, so okay, this is area three, this is area two, this is area one. These are fairly large areas. You can see that they're uh, uh, 12 degrees by seven degrees of latitude, uh, six degrees by six degrees, and uh, 14 degrees by five degrees of latitude and longitude. So these are pretty big areas. These are the time plots where we're looking at the drought year in blue, which is 2010. And this is the average of 2007, 2008, 2009, and 2011. It excludes 2010. And that's because the fluorescence data only ran from, uh, from, 2007, uh, from 2007 to 2011. Anyways, so here for these three areas, you have the AVHR data. Here you have the MODIS data. They're similar in character, but uh, there's slightly more sensitivity with the MODIS data. So then I numerically integrated these data and plotted them up, and people thought I had fudged this. That I took this to my fluorescence coworkers, and they said, we don't believe it. And so I did it again. I thought, God, I must have done something wrong. I went back to all my formulas, redid it. Uh, but these are fairly large areas, and this is very encouraging. So what this says to me, at the large scale for large areas, you can make direct comparisons between these two satellite data sets, one of which is much better than the other and has a 250 meter spatial resolution, whereas the other data set has an eight kilometer spatial resolution. So 
Now that's for larger areas. Now I've since done this. So then I came in to, uh, to seven smaller areas and did that. And things still hold together well when you come down to smaller areas. So what this shows you is when you're comparing, comparing different data sets, if you operate at core scales, there, there will frequently be a very, very good association between them, or between these two data sets. As you come down to finer and finer scales, then you are able to see more variation in the finer scale data than we have in our more generalized data with these very broad bands. Okay, now here's, uh, uh, several of us have published a series of papers on above ground phytomass. This is in a herbaceous system in the tundra because the tundra is a herbaceous system. So um, uh, Reynolds, Walker, and Uma Bott are from the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Howie Epstein is University of Virginia. And then Jorge and I are from the Goddard Space Flight Center. So this is what the tundra looks like. It's uh, nice and flat. It's in the far north next to the Arctic Ocean, extends inland from there. And so what uh, Skip Walker and, uh, and Martha and Uma have done is they've gone out with their graduate students and postdocs, camped out, and then sampled areas one meter by one meter. Uh, and they may do one or two areas a year to get a calibration point of end of season, above ground primary production uh, in the tundra ecosystem. So here we have all of our destructively sampled areas in the tundra. Some are from Eurasia on the Yamal Peninsula in Russia. Some are on the north, show, on the north slope of Alaska in blue. So here are the data uh, compared to AVHR data, our data set. Here are the data compared to MODIS data from the AQUA instrument, and here are the same biomass data compared to the MODIS data from the Terra, or the Terra MODIS instrument. And so they're all very similar, and this is very encouraging. This is why you have calibration areas. So that looks good. So then uh, any, any, any time I use any MODIS data, I always compare the AQUA data to the MODIS data uh, uh, from Terra. Uh, and if the two MODIS instruments don't agree, then someone has misprocessed the data. These are data which we process ourselves, and uh, 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 so this is one of the first things I always test to, to make sure that both data sets are okay because they should agree. Okay, so then we took our AVHR data. We were able to, to extend things back to 1982, and now I've extended them back to 1981, and we look at trends in the tundra area, and this overlay right here and on around like this is uh, based upon vegetation mapping is what we looked at. So if we go from 1982 to 2010, there was about a 20% increase. And if we go from 1981 to 1982 to 2010, 2011, there was about a 16% increase. That's because when you're looking at trends, the endpoints really matter. So here's 1981, and then it falls down to 1982. Now our data only started in July of 1981. But fortunately, the growing season at higher northern latitudes is very, very short. Uh, and so what we have used are the data for July and August. And that's what our coworkers in Alaska have used. But this just shows you the importance of including more data. And the reason that was not included before was because the data didn't also include June. And now I've added 2012 to it. And it's about right here. And then here is a coincident comparison to the MODIS data from Terra. And this drop right here was due to the eruption of Mount Pinatubo, which was a very cooling event, especially at higher northern latitudes. Um, this is a paper which we recently published in Nature Climate Change. And this is Ranga Mainini and his student, Alan Zhu. Uh, uh, they were the principal authors on it. And then there was a cast of uh, maybe 10 of us who helped. Uh, so here, we're looking at the normalized difference of vegetation index. We're, we're looking at higher northern latitudes north of 60 degrees. Uh, we're also looking at sea ice, snow, and temperature. And these are just comparisons. But for all of these metrics, there's a strong association between them and between the normalized difference of vegetation index, either, either directly or else in an inverse way. Uh, here is a better comparison. Now we're looking for the entire Arctic. This is north of 60 degrees. It's, it, it's also, it was published in our paper. 
we see uh, an, uh, an NDVI increase of about 5% per decade. This is very similar to the results we got from the destructive sampling only in the tundra area. So we come along like this. Here's the Pinatubo dip on up like this. Here are the MODIS data. So there's a very good correspondence between the MODIS data and our time series data from the NOAA instruments and the NOAA satellites. And then here's a plot of the photosynthetically active period's average temperature. And so things were colder here, then they warmed up. There's quite a bit of variation to it. And now it's been much warmer here. And there's this increase. So we're seeing a trend of about 5% per decade from, 19, from the 1980s, 1990s, and, and, and for the 2000s uh, in both of these data sets. And that's because the temperature is what is increasing primary production because it's warmer. The plants are able to grow more because they have a longer growing season. Um, here, we've broken it down to the tundra biome and also uh, uh, everything north of 65 north. So this is just in the far north. And this is from 65 north north. And so over this time period, you have a very comparable trend in these two areas. Now I'll show you some other results of those that are somewhat more difficult to understand. Um, I'll leave this PowerPoint presentation, and, and anyone is welcome to look at it. Uh, but as I said, if you find some mistakes, please inform me. The, this was the stratification of what we've included in, in our different zones. So. Uh, if we're talking about the Arctic, it's vegetation north of 65 north. It includes the tundra uh, and the tundra south of 65 north and no needle leaf forests. If we talk about the boreal zone, this is from 45 north to 65 north now. It includes all needle leaf forests, no tundra crops or broadleaf forests or grasslands south of forests. So this is, is how uh, this work was done by Rangum and Allen. And now let's look at some of the results. So uh, we're looking, if, if we take these data over time and use different metrics to express trends. One is a linear trend on the upper left. This is an autoregressive model of the first order with lags on the right. And this is an autoregressive integrated moving average. If you have questions about these techniques, refer to our paper. But what you see are the trends. So, so in, in these purple colors, you have about an 8% increase per decade. There are some areas where you have major increases. There are other areas where you have much more moderate increases in all these different techniques. There are some advantages in some areas to one trend over another. We feel this one is the most robust. So this is one way of looking at this. I'll show you the results of this very shortly. We also look at the May to September, May to September temperature trends from 80, 1982 to, to 2011 in the same way. Now the temperature data are extrapolated from individual MET stations, and so you have huge gaps. So they're not spatially continuous. Whereas our satellite data, one of the cool features of satellite data is they are spatially continuous. Now this is just a comparison. Uh, and the key thing is when you're comparing trends between the temperature data and the normalized difference vegetation index for the warm period, for the, for, the, for the photosynthetically active period, if it's green, it means they both agree. They both had the same sign. If it's yellow, it, it means that, that, uh, that one agreed and the other, there was no trend in it. So, you notice most of these areas are green. There are a few areas which are red where they disagree. But in general, there's a very strong correspondence between these greens and these yellows. And also this very light green, which is the other way around, where there's no trend is this washed out yellow. But anytime you do a study like this, you end up with more questions in some areas than you started with. Why is this this way? Why is that that way? Uh, and this is one of the, of the nice things about research. Frequently, you end up with more questions than when you started. This is no exception. OK, now what we found, and this is a way of preparing you for the next two slides. Um, on the right in red, we have the zonally averaged 
Photosynthetically active period mean temperature. This means that period of time when the temperatures were above zero, you had to have, uh, as the temperatures came along and they started to get above freezing for the daytime minima, or minimum temperatures, then you started your growing season until that changed and you had daytime minimum temperatures colder or, or below zero centigrade. Um, anyway, this solid plot uh, is where we had temperatures in the third decade of our study. And these dashed temperatures are where we had temperatures in the first decade of our study. So this expresses the warming at higher northern latitudes. Um, in blue, we have our NDVI data, which are integrated for the non-freezing period of the growing season. And in the dashed line are these data from the early 1980s. So this difference then goes from the early 1980s to the latter part of the third decade. And so this expresses the warming in terms of temperature, and this is the associated warming uh, with respect to latitude from 50 to 75 north for those two time periods. So it's getting warmer and plants are growing more. Um, so, okay, these are some of the trends. Uh, and um, here we have the data uh, expressed as percent per decade. And then on the right-hand side, we have the equivalent changes in the length of the growing season. So when you have these data, you can express the results in terms of our index in question, this index of, of, of photosynthetic potential. Or you can then have some metric when you start the growing season and when you end it and actually calculate the change in the number of days. And I'll expand upon that in a subsequent paper. This, these um, sort of histogram plots of the probability density show the difference between different areas. And so uh, the important thing is that these are positive results. So this simply shows there was this large concentration of areas which increased. Uh, so this is Arctic positive, this is boreal positive, and then these are the negative areas. So in what we define as the Arctic and boreal zone, far more areas experienced positive changes that, uh, than didn't. Um, the same uh, is over here in terms of the length of the growing season. So these differences uh, for, um, for the Arctic positive um, and the boreal positive then represent in terms of temperature, these increases. Now, it, this is somewhat confusing and I probably shouldn't have included it, but this is much easier to understand. So now we're looking at the conclusions of our paper and that is that the climate is shifting. So I might say it's like Winnipeg moved to Minnesota because we have a several latitude shift in degrees of latitude. Uh, if we look at comparable growing conditions in our data set in the early part of the record to the latter part. So for example, here we're looking at the observed temperature seasonality. And so here we start uh, in the early 1980s. And, and, and then here we go to the mid 1990s, halfway through our 30 year period. And then here we go the entire 30 years. And so we're expressing averaged completely in a circumpolar way what this latitude shift was like. And this is quite remarkable. It's degrees of latitude, uh, two in 15 years and 5.2 uh, uh, in terms of the temperature seasonality. Uh, that's quite remarkable. So this is in the boreal zone. Here is the Arctic area where it is where you have a similar trend, but it's reduced. It's one and a half degrees for 15 years, and it's four degrees for 30 years. So I think we managed to make a lot of people mad. And so now we're going through this, proving this and substantiating it. But in climate studies, sometimes you need to stir up the hornet's nest, especially with the climate change deniers. Uh, so now we're looking at the vegetation index data. And um, one of us has misspelled vegetation. Uh, you always notice these things when you make presentations. So here's the boreal zone and here's the Arctic zone. 
Now, the first question which comes out, in the first 15 years, you had almost a six degree of latitude shift in our normalized difference vegetation index. But over the 30 years, it only increases slightly. That's because just because it's warmer in the boreal zone doesn't mean it's going to be wetter. So you can warm up to where you start to encounter water limitations. Now we're trying to figure out if it's snow or if it's water. And I let the cat out of the bag yesterday when Spencer asked me, and I said, oh, what? we think it's now snow. Well, this might change tomorrow. When I get back, someone says, no, we've checked that. It's not. Now, in the Arctic, though, we have a very different situation. For 15 years, we had a 2.2 degree shift, and then we had a 7 degree shift if we look at 30 years. So when you have data like these, you, it, it leads you to, you have to study what you've done. Um, this is why you publish them. Uh, and we're still reconciling things, trying to figure out what the mechanisms are, et cetera. Now, this is a model extrapolation of if we uh, were to extrapolate these results with models um, from, uh, from, uh, from 1950 to, uh, uh, to the 21st century, we have some very major changes. So the Arctic might move 20 degrees south, and the boreal zone might move 21 degrees south. Now, that's a simulation result. But this is some of the things you can do. OK, so now I'll talk about the last paper. And this is a really cool paper. One of the great things about being in science, and Marv and all the professors here know the same thing, you get to work with some really hardworking, clever students. And they see and do things you never would have thought to do, and probably don't have the skills to do them in, some, in, in many cases. But this is the great thing about universities, that you learn, you publish papers, people come along, and then they leapfrog over you. This is an example of that. So the first author, Jonathan Berovich, just got his PhD at the Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. He's now on a postdoc in France. He was a student of Keith Briffa. Um, and so Renga Mainini and Philip Sias and, and Tim Osborne and myself um, and Shilong Piao all took part in this. This is a study which we worked with Jonathan on it. He did most of the work, and he deserves most of the credit. The climate data which we used were the Climate Research Unit air temperature data from 1950 to 2011, freeze-thaw data from the National's uh, Snow and Ice Data Center. These are microwave data. And then some snow-free data from 1972 to 2011. The vegetation data we used were our NDVI 8-kilometer global data set from 82 to 2011. And then Jonathan also used the Point Barrow carbon dioxide data from the Point Barrow station, which measures atmospheric carbon dioxide. OK, so the results, and then I'll show you some of the figures. Um, from, um, um, from 1982 to 2011, using completely different data sets than we used in the previous paper, there was a lengthening in the thermal growing season of 10 and a half days. This is unprecedented from the surface temperature record. Uh, over the past 60 years when you have those data. Uh, but the curious thing was, it was about uh, a 12 and a half days in Eurasia, but in North America, it was barely six days. So uh, um, we're not getting as hot as Eurasia, but perhaps we were hotter to start with. I don't know. Um, there was also very good agreement with the normalized difference vegetation index with our data set and carbon dioxide from Point Barrow in spring. But then things fell off in the fall. So we have no trouble determining the start of season. But at the end of the growing season, we call it now the autumnal mess. And we're trying to figure out, is it a photo period uh, constraint we're encountering? Or what exactly is going on? So once again, you perform a study like this. Part of it works very well, and part of it doesn't. So we're thrashing around about this. Now, we also found a 22% increase in the amplitude, in the yearly amplitude from the minima to the maxima over this record of 1972 to 2011, a 22% increase in the drawdown amplitude of the detrended carbon dioxide data. Uh, and there was earlier spring CO2 uptake because the growing season started earlier. 
But in the fall, there was actually a net release uh, from respiration, which overwhelmed the drawdown as the growing season was ending. This was quite surprising to us. Now, I actually have a copy of the paper here, but uh, I suggest if you're interested in the paper, you should get it. And many of the figures are rather small. But I'll just look at some of the correlations, then stop and, and answer any questions. So in terms of seasonal NDVI and temperature, uh, circumpolar, we had this correlation. We explained about half of the variation between the, the thermal surface temperature data and our normalized difference vegetation index time integral. Uh, we explained more, about 64% of the variation for Eurasia, and we explain less for North America, as I mentioned before. In terms of, of seasonal NDVI and net CO2 uptake, we don't do very well. So some things work well, other things don't. Um, now, if we look at the comparisons, which are actually quite good, between the freeze-thaw data and the Hadley Climate Research Unit surface temperature data, they are quite good, circumpolar, about 0.8, 0.8 and 0.9, respectively, for the circumpolar for Eurasia and for North America in the spring. And in the autumn, they fall off, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and 0.5, respectively, circumpolar Eurasia and North America. So some curious things are going on. But with satellite data, we're able to at least identify where they are and what they are. Now we have to figure out why they are. So once again, we have more work to do. Uh, so this just shows you uh, where we stand in terms of the start of the season, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, 0 0.7 for circumpolar Eurasia and North America. In terms of the aggregate correlation, in this case, between the NDVI and the surface temperature data. So we get the start very well. Uh, the end of the season, 0 0.7, 0 0.45, and 0.46. So we don't do very well for the end of the growing season. But for the length of the growing season, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and 0.65. So this, I think, is the last slide I have. No, this is the last slide I have, which um, um, shows the correlation between our integrated normalized difference vegetation index on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis and the peak-to-trough carbon dioxide um, amplitude at Point Barrow. So there's some areas that show a very, very high correlation, or actually a negative correlation, because as the amplitude drops, that means carbon dioxide is being absorbed. And that's why you have this negative relationship. <coughs> so I'm curious what's going on in Finland and Sweden, and maybe this area, as opposed to other areas. So once again, we've ended up in a situation where we have more questions than answers. So thanks for your attention. Uh, uh, if you're interested, I'll leave this. You can see the papers. Uh, one of them is in Marv's journal, this paper by Rasmus Finholt and Simon Proud. But they're all uh, interesting papers. The one in Global Change Biology, um, which Jonathan is the first author on, is a very substantial paper. And uh, there's a lot of cool information about climate, the use of satellite data, these various data sets which were used, which I'm sure can be used for other things too. So thanks. Jim, that was excellent. You've made a lot of progress yeah. in, in these years working with NDVI. I, I think there's some very significant results here. Now, some questions from you folks. Michelle. Maybe you have an obvious answer, but is there, um, did you look at the differences between the like, vegetation and the racial vegetation, and would that have an effect on the amount of CO2 uptake in different areas? We didn't look at it, and it very well could. Because I would also wonder if that has anything to do with um, if senescence is the reason at the end of the season, where um, if you have a mixture of herbaceous and woody vegetation, if they're stopping, you know, if they're stopping their uptake in some areas that have more mixture, whereas you have other areas that are more positive. Hopefully, some of our Flux Tower friends will be able to answer these questions. Or say, well, of course, in this area, because of the fetch, associated with the station. This is why this is that way. 
but we honestly don't know at this point. 